So hi everybody, I'm, I'm John Schneider from, from Netflix. As Hans says, we've worked with Hans for the past couple of years. Uh, I'm here to demonstrate to you Gradle Lint, which is still kind of in pre 1.0. It's been around for about a month and we're using it internally at Netflix, but it continues to evolve rapidly. So um, there'll be a larger form of this talk at Gradle Summit if you choose to come and by then I'm sure it'll be more fully fleshed out. Uh, but to understand why we needed to, yeah. I can certainly do that. Yeah, to understand uh, why we needed to develop a great Olymp plugin, first of all, you have to understand that Netflix, we have this cultural principle called freedom and responsibility. And I say the assignment operator is intentional because really that freedom and responsibility culture defines Netflix. It's why Netflix is what it is. So what that really means is that every team, uh, Every engineering team at Netflix can develop in really whatever fashion they want. They use different languages. They use different build tools sometimes. Um, they don't always abide by the same operating system. So it's, you know, there's a wide range of, of things going on there. That, and really these different technologies and techniques that different teams use suit the individual functions that they're working on. So it's, it's really great. Um, however, I work for the Netflix developer productivity team and that's a central team, uh, a centralized team that's supposed to help all teams build their code more efficiently. Uh, so for our team, we've got kind of one part social engineering and one part software engineering as we try to uh, convince everybody that they want to they want to move forward and they want to do the, the next uh, greatest and, and best thing, uh, even though their build works today. Um, so that, that's kind of the challenge that confronts us. So we introduce so rather than uh, and. One other piece of context. We have about 5,000, I'd say, there's more than 5,000 distinct uh, Gradle files at, just in the wild at Netflix. So if our team of roughly four people that work on Gradle wanted to go make a change through all 5,000 of those things, it would take quite a while. Um, so we want to be able to somehow automate this. Um, so what can Gradle Lint do? It, it's helping us right now um, remove cruft. Uh, we we get a lot of questions from teams. We, we, we tend to identify bad practices that are, that are just universally bad. So we want to be able to bar those practices and help teams not do that. Uh, we want to be able to sanitize dependencies, do things like uh, keep the Gradle version up to date. So if all these various teams, maybe three or 4,000 of these builds have the Gradle wrapper checked in and we want to go to the next version of Gradle, we want to be able to, to push that along. Um, but most importantly, uh, we want to be able to auto-fix violations that we find. So if any of you are familiar with a uh, linting tool like ESLint, it does a great job at surfacing to you what the problem is, spe specific piece of code that the, that's causing the problem, maybe even a little hint as to how to fix it. Um, honestly, that's not enough, I think, for a lot of our teams. They're just so busy trying to deliver uh, business functionality and doing what they do that getting a report with a bunch of lint violations is just going to be aggravating to them. So when, when we give them a violation, we want to be able to give them a fix and be, be able to have one command to always just fix their builds. Um, importantly though, we don't want to do it for them. Because you know, if we do something and we break something, that's also bad. So <laughs> this is definitely this is a tightrope walk that helps us preserve freedom and responsibility, but keep the, the engineering teams moving forward uh, with best practices and, and that we've identified. So it's a lot of explanation, sorry. Um, this is, you know, like a Gradle plugin, any Gradle plugin, you uh, apply it, no surprise there. Um, and then there's, you basically define a set of Gradle Lint rules that you want applied. Yikes, that's kind of small, but we're going to roll with it. Um, so uh, rules uh, are composed of a source file and also a uh, sort of a metadata resource file works very much like a Gradle plugin, source file, resource file. And so the Gradle Lint plugin can scan the class path looking for uh, these rules that you've provided. And somewhere in an enterprise-y way, we have like a, we have a uh, init script that we apply to most of our builds. Somewhere in an enterprise-y way, you can kind of define the rules that you want to apply across the organization. And that's kind of how we roll with it. Um, to run it, you can of course just run, you know, Gradle W Link Gradle. Uh, but the way the, the Lint plugin is written, uh, it attaches itself to the end of most tasks. Uh, so when you run build or you run test or you run assemble or any of those kind of things, um, the Lint is going to run and it's going to report violations at the end of the build. 
Um, it's not going to uh, change your code. It's not going to do anything like that. It's just going to uh, give you some warnings. And then finally, if you want to take action, you can just run <coughs> fix Gradle Lint. Just fixes everything. Um, so let's see an example of this um, in action um, with one of our open source dependent or open source projects called Priam, which is a a, uh, a great example, I think, of um, a team. This is from our uh, our um, basically like a database type folks. Um, so they have a real like narrowly focused specialty on optimizing Cassandra, getting these kind of things to work. Um, they're not going to care a whole lot about their Gradle script. And you're going to see that in a minute. Um, the, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to go ahead and, uh, and run the fixes. I'm going to compile as well. That what this uh, build is going to uh, show you is a, a rule called the unused dependency rule. Um, and I'll explain what that does in a, in a few minutes. But it's going to run. So this is a team that had, had uh, taken a bunch of dependencies. There's several uh, sub-projects <coughs> in this big multi-project build. And they weren't really sure what dependencies they wanted to use. So they just kind of like copied the set of dependencies from project to project. You know, not unusual. So um, here you'll see that the lint rule identified all these unused dependencies. Um, so we just struck them all, you know, basically. And if you look at the diff, you can see that for any one given project, we've just wiped out you know, a whole lot of the dependencies. It doesn't leave a whole lot, actually, um, <laughs> remaining. <laughs> but that's good. Um, this is really important to us because we have, like I said, about 5,000-ish projects. I don't even honestly know how many of them are really actively in development. But um, if you have a really low-level project that gets, that's get, that gets pulled in, um, these kind of dependencies that get struck, like this one is a, is a killer right here, right? Guava 15. Guava 15 is going to provide a, a recommendation on that version to all of its downstreams. So anything that pulls in whatever this library is, is going to now have this version recommendation. If that thing that pulled it in, God forbid, actually needed to run on Guava 14, Gradle is going to conflict resolve it up to Guava 15, <coughs> and that might cause a runtime error. So um, anytime we can remove unused dependencies, it just, it just lessens the scope of version conflict resolution problems, um, which are the source of much evil in the Java world. So. Um, so that's kind of cool. Um, kind of hidden behind the scenes here on this unused dependency plugin specifically, it not only removes, as it's implemented right now, it not only removes unused first order dependencies, it also adds transitive dependencies that you actually have compile time references to. Um, so that's kind of one of those things people, you know, accidentally sort of dependent on a transitive dependency, then that transitive dependency no longer exists and suddenly your code doesn't compile anymore. Um, that's no fun. Align fixed first order dependency versions with transitives when conflicts are resolved. That's a, that's a mouthful. But there's been this argument we've heard from teams that come from a Maven background where they're used to Maven resolving uh, conflicts with nearest, like the nearest uh, version first. And Gradle adopted the Ivy uh, strategy, which is latest version wins. Um, so it kind of goes back and forth. Honestly, there's pros and cons to both. There's not really one that's objectively better. Um, so at least what this will do, say you have a first order dependency and you've, you've said, I want Guava 15. And one of your transitives somewhere deep down is, is requires Guava 18. You're actually going to get Guava 18. You just may not know it. So we want Lint to go ahead and surface that and say, we're, we're just going to replace what you thought you wanted with, with Guava 18. So at least we're decorative about about what we expect, and there's no surprises. And then lastly, and this is a source of much consternation as well, we shuffle first order dependencies of the correct configurations. Um, this really hurt us when we moved from Java 7 to Java 8. Uh, we had some people with uh, like bad fine bugs dependencies that were no longer Java 8 compatible. They really didn't need to be on the compiled scope, but they were. So they were winding up. Not, not only do we have to go after the, te the, uh, the team um, that had that first order dependency in the compile scope, but then any older versions of that library that were previously in existence, but you kind of had to walk all the way downstream. Um, JUnit's another one. People kind of sloppily put that in compile sometimes or runtime. Um, it really belongs in test compile. So we'll, we'll look at the actual usage. You're going to find the JUnit's used in your tests. So we'll move it to test compile. Uh, and that helps out quite a bit as well. Um, so let's create a simple rule 
um, just to see how that works. And this is going to be a completely hypothetical example, but from a scenario we considered at one point, which uh, our team kicked around this idea of requiring, <laughs> again, freedom and responsibility, so this is tough, but requiring everybody that, that creates a ward to publish it to our binary repository so we could scrape some insight into it. We didn't actually do that, but let's uh, suppose we had a plugin, a Gradle plugin called Netflix War Publish that would do that work for us. Just, <coughs> it would just publish it. We'll just uh, pretend that exists. Um, so here's an example of a rule. This is a, um, a really naive implementation, and we'll go through a few iterations. So to create a rule, you just create a new class, extend Gradle lint rule. Um, this has all the functionality, like all the, uh, <coughs> the visitors of a groovy AST visitor. This is also an extension on top of CodeNARC, so it has any of the CodeNARC visitors as well. Plus, Gradle lint rule has added some specific visit methods for Gradle specific constructs, like visit apply plugin, visit dependency, visit um, exclude, things like that, you know, visit configurations, um, basically DSL constructs that we think are going to be people are going to write rules around quite a bit, so you don't have to reinvent that every time. So here we're going to just say whenever the war plugin is applied, so whenever, whenever we see a visit apply plugin and we see war, we're going to add a lint violation, we're going to say wars must be published, and then we're going to provide the autofix rule, which is just insert after this particular AST method, and we're going to provide a message for the user, or this is the actual fix, applied plugin netflix.ward-publish. Um, and that's that. So you add the violation, you add the auto fix, and that's the way it works. Um, like I said, this is a naive implementation because um, suppose that, what's number two? Suppose that somebody has already applied the Netflix.war publish plugin, then we don't want to apply it again. So uh, let's make it a little bit more complicated. Um, <coughs> Gradle Lint also has a bookmark met method. <coughs> so you can, when you see a particular DSL construct, you can just bookmark it for now. <coughs> Here we'll bookmark apply war where we see it, and we'll bookmark the apply war publish where we see it. And then at the very end in visit class complete, which is kind of like that very last visitor that the Groovy AST uses, we can say if apply war is present, but apply war is not pre or publish is not present, then we add the same violation. So version number two. Version number three, just to demonstrate that you can do slightly different things other than just inserting. We're going to do the same thing. We're going to bookmark apply war, bookmark apply war publish. And at the very end, we're going to add a lint violation. But rather than uh, inserting another plugin, we're going to replace the, uh, the uh, apply war um, with, with our new thing. This assumes that this war publish plugin applies the war plugin for you, which it probably would if we actually implemented something like that. <coughs> Um, one other thing to note here, th this is, you know, this add vi lint violation returns a violation, replace with returns the same violation, so you can compose um, fixes. Sometimes there's, there's several fixes for any one given lint violation, so you can do that as well. Number four, um, <clears throat> become Gradle model aware. If we implement the special Gradle model aware interface, uh, we can actually use the Gradle model itself. Um, because the war plugin may be applied by some other plugin that's not visible to us in the source of the build.gradle. So in this case, we want to actually look to see does the resolved Gradle module or model have the war plugin applied? And have we yet applied the war publish plugin? And if not, then insert it. So there's four variations on basically the same thing that hopefully show you a little bit more uh, complexity. Um, and really, I promise to be short and sweet, I think, um, that's that. What are your uh, questions about anything Netflix related to? And we can bring Hans back up here as well. Like yes. Yeah, so the question was, since we don't uh, run and check in the changes, how do we force people to, to run? That was actually the million dollar question before we release this thing into the wild inside of Netflix. And, you know, so, you just have to observe it empirically. And in the first like three or four days after it was released, I think about 200 teams had already just uh, had just done it. Um, so you know we 
we try to, we kind of have like a build owners group that we email. There's not a whole lot of participants in it, so people have discovered it and, and gone about it and, and done it. So that's the key is, you know, surfacing something that's easy to do, that's, that's painless, you know, and, uh, and it's just super obvious. So we even took the extra step of teaching Jenkins how to uh, ANSI color Gradle output so that the warning was like red. You know, they like, they couldn't avoid seeing it if they looked at their build output in Jenkins. So it was, it's just like, and that's what I think is, is fun. Like I said, you know, the, the developer productivity team is like half social engineering, half software engineering. Uh, before we did this, we just emitted a lot of warnings and build and builds. And what we found is people just ignored them, you know. And I, I, I finally broke, um, I broke, not the build, I broke, when I ran a build and the only output was just warnings. <laughs> was, how do you not do something? You know, but that's the thing, you know, there's going to be some people in the organization that really care about builds, but, uh, you know, a lot of people are just, you know, narrowly focused on de delivering that really uh, valuable uh, business functionality, whatever that is. So anything we can do to kind of take care of it for them is, is good. Yeah, yeah the, the question was, have we considered <coughs> enforcing standards by breaking builds if, uh, for certain violations? I think our current approach is this. All the lint rules that we introduced, there's some that are open source, there's some that are internal. All of them that we released, released so far are warnings. Um, we also publish metrics. There's a hook in Gradle lint to publish. Uh, or do something with the violations, basically. And we publish metrics. So we can basically track violations, specific violations, over time by team. Um, so we'll see a violation, hopefully, you know, fall to zero. And once it falls to zero, then we'll probably turn it into an error to slam the door behind them so they don't, you know, reintroduce something that we've, we've gotten past already. Um, but, um, yeah, we're trying to be in the, we just never want to be in their way if we can. If we can avoid it, the and the you know the other good thing about the the metrics is if we get down to say like ten violations remaining over the past week and they all belong to the same team, it's not that onerous for us four to go to that team and you know give them some one-on-one -on -one coaching and help, and we're we're totally willing to do that. Uh, it's just when you have to get all five thousand builds that it's that it's pretty hard to do, so. Yeah, and, and the question here is, can you pre prevent them from promoting to production for certain errors? You absolutely could. If we could fail to build. Um, I, it's just not the Netflix way. So it's a freedom of responsibility thing. I'm going to surface it for you. If you want to proceed with this, this error or this warning, uh, good luck. You know? uh, it, but we trust that they know what they're doing, that, they, you know, that it's not the right time, that, that there's some misalignment. Uh, and then we'll, we'll come back to it and get, take care of it eventually. That's right here. And the project uh, remove a check, say this is not a mistake for us. A absolutely. I, I, I meant to demonstrate that in a way, but the question was, can a project, uh, you know, declaratively say this is not a problem for us? Like your pattern <coughs> matching logic isn't good enough. Um, we d the plugin does introduce a uh, construct where you can say gradle lint dot ignore, open block, and then anything inside of that block. It's ignored, or you can be specific. You can say gradlelint.ignore, and then provide a list of, of the rule IDs, and it'll just ignore those rules. Um, what we like about that approach is, you know, people aren't turning off linting altogether, um, and they're adding some declarative statement in their build that says, I'm choosing to ignore this. So when that person leaves and somebody else comes in and goes, why are we choosing to ignore this? At least it's there, it's present, it's visible. Because um, otherwise, often what you'll see is like a dash x link gradle, like somewhere in a Jenkins configuration. Nobody even knows it's there, doesn't know that it's being ignored, and um, you know, bad things happen. So, yeah, I think this gentleman has his hand up over here. The question is uh, to, for all the distinct uh, gradle builds that we have in the wild, have we tried? categorizing dependency usage. Um, we do have another tool, and I could, I could show you this a little bit later, but uh, we have a tool called Astrid internally, which does, um, you know, scrapes up all the dependency information uh, and allows you to start from somewhere, say start from some project and look at all the downstream usages of that project at specific versions or times 
shows you where it goes all the way into production and see, it says, you know, this library <coughs> is being used in these ASGs in these regions and so yeah, forth. This is just something I want to go back to the land as well. So. Yeah. Right yeah. I think there's a question here. How, how big is the developer productivity team uh, relative to the total number of developers? Um, so the Gradle folks here is about four, and that's just a subset of developer productivity. There's nine of us total. Um, there's some, some of them work on the bakery, uh, you know, help with Artifactory and, and our continuous integration environment. So there's a lot of functions. And there's roughly 800 engineers altogether. So. I don't know whether that's big or small, but it is what it is. Yes. Um, the question, <laughs> there's another sore point. Um, the question was, are there any non-JVM projects that use Gradle? Um, yes, pretty much all of them do. So we have an increasing amount of node users um, at, uh, at Netflix. Uh, to be perfectly honest, uh, they use Gradle um, kicking and screaming because uh, whether it's reasonable or not, a lot of uh, our developer, JavaScript developers don't even want to have a JDK installed on their machine. Um, so what we do use it for is right now our OS package functionality, which takes whatever your end result is that you, you want in the cloud and turns it into a Debian package, which then gets passed to the bakery to turn into an Amazon machine image, which then becomes the unit of, of deployment. Um, that, you know, the like taking the final node app, <coughs> Uh, and, uh, and creating a deb out of it winds up in a, in a Gradle script. So they may use something like Webpack, um, you know, to actually build their code, and then there'll be a secondary step to, to build the OS package. So, uh, the, the question is, is Gradle the only tool in use, or is there still some Maven and Ant? Um, let freedom ring again. Wherever there's freedom and responsibility, you can guarantee there's going to be some variation. Um, some, some good examples of why Maven is still in use. We have people that specifically contribute to Pig and Hadoop and that whole infrastructure. Um, some of them are like owners or committers to those various projects, and they're all Maven based. Um, it's just, you know, historically or whatever, that's, that's how they've been. Uh, so they'll continue to do that. Um, like yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's just, it's it's the path of least resistance. It's the it's the paid road, if you, so to speak. Um, so if you, for example, if you use Maven, you know what are you going to do for OS package? You're going to have you know we don't provide a Maven solution for that. So you're either rolling your own or you're you have a secondary step. So uh, most people are going to use Gradle because that's the they just don't want to think about that step. We've thought about it. Um, it's just easiest for them. Yeah, the question is, would we migrate from uh, those, those users from Maven to Gradle? Um, I, I suppose if anybody's on Maven today, they are for a reason, like the Pig and Hadoop folks. Um, there was an effort a couple years ago. We were on an <laughs> Ant Ivy-based system. We moved to Gradle. Um, yeah, there was a huge migration effort there. Um, you know, I, I don't think there's anybody left that's in, you know, unintentionally still on uh, a build system other than Gradle. Hans? Thanks a lot. Sure. Awesome. Great.